Hello, uh, I'm Roger Hammerly, and I'm giving a talk today entitled Hiring is Not Pacing. If you have questions about the talk or you want to talk to me about it, please engage on Twitter. Um, I'm on Twitter way more often than I should be, and my Twitter handle is the underscore Thackermizer. So let's get started. Let's get started, and I'm going to start with the obvious. Interviews suck. I've read so many blog posts, Twitter threads, Facebook rants, etc., about how much it sucks to be interviewing for a job. And you know, I, I agree. Interviews suck. And I'd actually argue that it's more complicated than that. And that tech interviews, they suck more. I've thrown this out to Twitter a couple times, and the anger people have around tech interviews is astounding and quite frankly, mostly, mostly completely valid. Tech interviews are awful, and we all kind of hate them. But I'm here with hopefully a slightly more positive message than that, in that I actually believe we can do better. And this talk is going to cover a number of things that I believe can improve interviewing in tech. So some of these are small things. They're things that you as a single interviewer can do in the 45 minutes to an hour that you get to spend with a candidate. Some of the things I'm going to recommend are larger, and they may require buy-in from your manager or even your legal or your HR team. Also, most of these things are opinions. Some of this is based on some research that I've done or research that I've read, I'm mostly research that I've read. I'm not, I'm not a researcher. But a lot of this is just based on the hundreds of interviews that I've given and the dozens I've done as an interviewee. And my experience was with those. So let's actually get started and see how we can do better. But first, let's address the elephant seal in the room. I work at Google and Google is infamous for their interviews. Trust me, I know. I failed my first three rounds of interviews with Google and they weren't pleasant experiences. And quite frankly, I wouldn't have tried that last fourth time if I hadn't been in a mental place where I didn't actually need the job. And I was lucky enough that fourth time to have a friend that I really trusted cheering me on and helping me through the process. I think I can safely say that Google's hiring process doesn't work for a lot of people. And as a hiring manager at Google, and you know, quite frankly, as a human being, that really, really frustrates me. And that frustration is actually part of what motivated me to dig into various ways of tech hiring and then motivated this talk. But I wanna make it super clear up front. I haven't fixed Google interviews. I'm trying. I'm working with some really fantastic people to see what we can do to make it better, see what we can do to fix the whole process. But it's slow going. But I believe I have made the 45 minutes that candidates spend with me a little bit better by following the tips and tricks and changing my philosophy in the ways I'm going to talk about during this presentation. So let's start, let's start at the top. Um, assessing technical skill. Whenever I ask people about tech interviews, one of the things they object to the most is how we assess technical skills. So I started my process here by looking at all the different ways that we assess technical skills, trying to figure out which one is best. So whiteboard coding, traditional way to assess technical interviews, and people hate it, hate it, but we still do it. So there must be some good reasons for that. So there's some pros and cons. Um, first of all, there's lots of existing prep materials for whiteboard coding. Lots of people have put a lot of dollars, hours, et cetera, into trying to figure out how to help people get better at this. Second of all, it's actually pretty inexpensive for companies to execute. I just need to have either a whiteboard or in the today's days, some sort of shared coding environment or shared doc so that we can you know, see the code that you write. Uh, the other nice thing is that it doesn't actually require a lot of time. It doesn't require a lot of time from the candidate to execute, just usually a 45 minute to an hour long interview. It doesn't require a lot of time for the interviewer to assess it because again, that same 45 minutes, one hour long interview. So the cons. Everyone hates it, hates it. I actually like it, but I understand that I'm weird and I'm pretty confident that I can say that everyone hates it. It's also not, not realistic. While we draw architecture diagrams on whiteboard and make it maybe be occasionally we'll copy a bit, like a snippet of code to a whiteboard so that we have access to it or can share it with our teammates, we never actually implement an entire function on a whiteboard or almost never. So it's not realistic. It's also super hard to assess objectively. Everyone grades this differently, which is actually, I think, what leads to a lot of the stress around it. Are you going to grade for missing semicolons? Are you going to grade for, you know, slightly wrong syntax? Are you going to let me use the standard library or not? These are all questions that people have going into whiteboard interviews that makes people do poorly on them or just refuse to do them altogether. 
And finally, interviewers ask really, really, really bad whiteboard questions. Just epically bad whiteboard questions. Okay, so the next most common technique I've seen for assessing technical skill is some sort of homework challenge. Uh, many folks say that this is actually a much more fair way of assessing technical ability than a whiteboard interview. So let's look at the pros and cons here. First of all, it's more realistic. It's actually doing a task to a spec or you know some sort of problem statement, which is pretty close to what we do on a daily basis as developers. Uh, you also get to use your tools and most of the time you get to use references. By the way, if you're asking a closed book homework question, just stop. Um, I get to use the Google when I'm coding. I get to use the standard lib. I get to use RI. Everyone should have access to the references when they're coding because otherwise it's not realistic. Coding is not a memory test. That's a problem solving task. Um, and then the other nice thing about homework is that you can give problems that take longer than 45 minutes to solve. And this actually and oftentimes will increase the realism of a challenge. Most of the problems that I solve in a coding basis don't start out as 45 minute tasks. They start out as bigger tasks that then I break down and so I can commit on a regular basis, et cetera. Uh, so the cons, there's actually a lot of cons here and I don't think we properly appreciate them all the time. First of all, it's really hard for anyone with any sort of caretaking responsibilities to do a homework challenge. Whether that's caring for an older relative, caring for children, uh, potentially just caring for our house and home. If you've just got a bunch of house chores or something that you need to get done over the course of a week, you're gonna have to plan ahead of time by quite a bit to figure out when to do a homework challenge. For someone who does most of the chores at home, maybe does all of the uh, cooking, things like that, finding a couple hours on a weekend or an evening to do a homework challenge is gonna be pretty hard. Um, it's also really hard, and I don't think this is fully appreciated, to help someone on a homework challenge who's gone the wrong way. When I'm doing whiteboard interviews, because it's one of the things that I have to do in my current role, even if I don't like them, um, if someone's going the wrong direction, I can say, okay, hey, hold up, back the, back the truck up, let's go this other way. However, if someone's doing a homework challenge and they start going the wrong direction, I won't know until they submit it. And when I was working at a company that did use homework, I frequently got, not 100% of the time, but you know, somewhere between 15 and 30% of the time, I got challenges that had just gone off the deep end in some way that didn't matter or had just interpreted the question incorrectly. Uh, the other thing is that most homework questions that we ask are bad. And one of the primary ways that they're bad is that they take too long. I have a lot of, I've heard from a lot of folks that their homework challenges are taking six, nine, 12 hours. No, 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 that, that's too long. So another day thing that I've heard a lot of folks, especially in this community uh, talk about is that, you know, just bring them on site and pair with them for a day or just bring them on site for the day and have them like kind of do a job shadow type situation. Uh, I've actually been offered an interview like this but I had to turn it down and I'll get to that in a second. So the pros, it's very realistic. You get to actually work with someone the way you'd work with them in the real job. Uh, it allows you to see if the candidate works well in a team, which is something that's really hard to tell in any of our other standard interviewing processes and is super duper important. Programming, software, team sport, not an individual sport. Uh, again, this is also depending on how you do it, much less prep for the interviewer. If you're literally just doing come on site for the day, they come on site for the day. Um, and so you don't actually have to do a ton of prep at all. Uh, cons. So the first big one that I think comes in here, and it actually plays into homework as well, there are significant potential ethical issues, in my opinion, about asking someone to do work for you without paying them. Um, just don't. And a lot of times you'll see homework assignments that really look like, hey, please, please, you know, design this feature for us that we're going to then ship on our website. No, don't do that. If this is actual work, you should be paying someone. Uh, there's also potential issues if you're going to pay someone around non-competes and anti-moonlighting clauses. When I was offered an interview like this, I actually had to turn it down for exactly this reason. They wanted to pay me, but I couldn't accept pay because my current job required that I was not paid for techni other technical work at the time. We can have discussions later about whether non-competes and anti-moonlighting clauses are ethical, but you don't want to get someone that you're trying to hire in trouble with their current employer. Uh, also, coming on day for a full uh, coming on site for a full day is super intimidating to a lot of folks. If folks don't have experience pairing, that's going to be intimidating to them there. But more importantly, it's hard to pick a task that is consistent and fair for a lot of folks. Like if you have a task and uh, you change which one you're doing based on what you're doing that day, it's not going to be a consistent way of assessing everyone. <sighs> So uh, I've also seen a number of folks say, look at their GitHub as a way of evaluating technical skill. Okay, let's talk about that one. I'm gonna make it a little bit broader and call this technique portfolio review. Basically, 
a portfolio is when you ask the candidate to share some examples of their work that they're particularly proud of and maybe discuss with them and discuss those examples with an interviewer. This is actually a standard part of interviews in many creative fields already, like design. So if you work at a bigger company that hires designers or hires other creative professionals, they may already have a way to do this for some roles. So cons and pros and cons of portfolio review. Pros, first of all, it allows the candidate to just show you their best work. So they get to pick the stuff that they're most proud of and they don't have to show you, you know, the stuff from earlier in their career or that you know, piece of code that they hacked together sometime really late one night to solve a problem and they know is bad. Again, it's also not a lot of prep for the interviewer. Show up and act interested or show up and ideally be interested and ask, ask some interesting questions about it. But again, there's a lot of cons. So most folks can't share code from previous jobs. And I mentioned that this technique of portfolio review is used in creative fields. In creative fields, say you're doing UI design, once the UI is shipped, anyone can theoretically access it. So if you're talking about the UI design that you built with a future employer, you're not revealing trade secrets because you're talking about something that's already been released. Uh, likewise, if you're talking about um, creative fields like marketing, people can show you ads that you know, were shipped. Those ads went out publicly, you know, billboards showed up in bus stations, that kind of thing. So there's not, there's not that trade secret math, there's not everything that they're going to be sharing is uh, already in public or already publicly available. That's not true of code. Since we don't normally ship our code when we ship a product in a way that customers can see, even if the product I worked on is, you know, already gone, GA is already shipped, I can't necessarily share the code with you because the code is still secret. So a lot of folks can't share code from their previous jobs. And this is one way that programming is different than other creative fields. Also, uh, many folks don't have significant time for significant OSS contributions. This comes back to folks with caretaking responsibilities, or quite frankly, folks who are super burnt out and they just don't want to spend their evenings working on code stuff. That is a valid option. That is 100% a valid thing. And we shouldn't require that folks spend all of their evenings and weekends, weekends doing open source in order to get a job in tech. Finally, it's really hard to differentiate with portfolio review between the absence of signal and the negative signal. And what I mean by that is if someone just doesn't have a lot of stuff in their portfolio, that doesn't tell us that they're a bad coder or that they're unqualified. It tells us that they don't have a lot of stuff in their portfolio, but a lot of people will interpret that as bad signal, that they're not capable. Bad signal is when the stuff in their portfolio tells us that they're bad. And this difference between absence of signal and bad signal is really, really hard, especially for junior interviewers to understand because sometimes they kind of look the same. If someone can't do something versus someone won't do something, doesn't have an example of something, it's hard to tell the difference. And so that's one of the cons of portfolio review. If you're looking for specific skills and someone just hasn't had a chance to show those skills in their portfolio, they're not gonna have that data, but they may still be able to do, to do it. So which of those is the best? E, none of the above. Uh, they all have pluses and minuses. No matter which one you pick, it won't work for someone. I guarantee this. Um, so basically what I would be thinking at this point is everything is awful. So we should just keep give up and keep doing what others did to us. Um, no, no, we should not. Of course not. That would be a very short talk. So when I started doing, so when I got to this point where I'm like, okay, well, if we can't switch to portfolio review or we can't switch to homework assignments from whiteboarding, what should we do? And I started just talking to folks about interviews. And here are some generalizations about what I heard. Um, I heard, I hate whiteboard interviews. That CS201 stuff isn't actually relevant to my job. Or I hate homework problems. The last one I did took like eight hours. Or I hate pairing interviews. I don't know anything about the company's domain or their code base. And so I always look really stupid. Or whiteboard interviews are so unfair. So what if I miss a semicolon? Or interviews all suck. I feel like the interviewer just wants to show off and make me look dumb. So more nihilism here, but there's actually something super subtle here that I think isn't really important. It turns out that for most folks, it wasn't just the method of the interview that made it hard. It was something more fundamental about the interview. It was, we ask, we're asking bad questions. CS201 stuff isn't relevant to the job or the homework problem that takes eight hours or we're asking questions about the company's domain when the candidate doesn't know anything about the domain and has no reason to know anything about the domain. We're also really doing a bad job of evaluating. I've seen a lot of folks take off points and we'll get to the fact that points in an interview is not a good idea when candidates don't know about the domain, even though they could easily bring them up to speed in just a couple weeks. Or people who say that if you miss a semicolon, you're a bad coder. No, no, 
semicolons and whiteboards, your whiteboard interpreter needs to be significantly more forgiving than that. I'm sorry. And finally, a lot of interviewers show up with a bad attitude without realizing it. They show up in this place where they see themselves as superior or a gatekeeper instead of someone who's trying to figure out who the right person to hire for their team. So we are kind of in a place where our interviews, tech interviews suck because we ask bad questions, we do a bad job of evaluating, and a lot of us just show up with bad attitudes. We can fix this. We can ask better questions, we can do a better job of evaluating, and we can show up holistically, all of us, with better attitudes. And the cool part of this is if we fix these things, we can improve all interviews, no matter what type they are. And best of all, most of these are changes that you can make immediately, immediately after finishing this talk, and they will apply to the next interview you do. And they're things you can do. You don't actually need buy-off from anyone else to do them in many cases. So let's dig in. How do we ask better questions? First off, keep it simple. So many interview questions and take home exercises are long and wordy and people aren't at their best in an interview situation. So please cut them some slack. Your actual problem statement should be a single sentence, maybe two tops. Um, to test that I've kept my question simple enough, I'd like to see if I can format it like this. Write a function that takes input X, does Y and returns Z. I don't always ask them this way, but I make sure that any question that I ask can be easily switched to this format because if these three pieces are missing, no one's going to be able to be successful right away. It's super important to me that there's a clear start and end point implied in the question. Um, here's a common question formatted in this way. Write a string that, write a function that takes a string and checks if it's a palindrome and returns true or false. You could also write this this way, write a palindrome tracker. But if you do, you need to be prepared that you're missing some of the information that was in the wordier version. And you're going to have to supply that, like what the input is. Is it a string? Is it a number? Is it a, you know, image blob? I don't know how you'd figure out the palindrome of an image blob, but I'm not 100% convinced that someone wouldn't try asking that. And you're also going to have to say, should it return true or false? Should it fail? Should it throw an exception if something's on a palindrome? So make sure that you know the answers to those questions and know the answers to how the longer form would be, even if you choose to ask the short form way. Um, the other thing I'd like to state is it's fine if your question seems super duper easy. Again, folks aren't at their best during interviews. One of my current go-to questions is the first homework question from the first chapter of an intro computing book for non-computer scientists. And I get plenty of signals from that question about design approaches, data structures, code clarity, et cetera, even with a very, very simple problem that is a one-liner in Ruby. Uh, another pattern I've seen bad questions is a lot of jargon. Uh, what do I mean by jargon? Um, there's the obvious stuff like slang that, or you know, regionalisms that folks from other parts of the country or other parts of the world may not know. There's also uh, jargon that you might use in your internal, internal teams. Google is famous for having a lot of internal jargon that means nothing to outsiders. But jargon actually can go deeper than that. So my favorite example of this is uh, <laughs> this is a data structure, Jason, describing my cat. So she's a cat named Emma, her species is feline, and she weighs somewhere north of 18 pounds at this point. She's put on a couple pandemic pounds. So what's the name of this data structure? Okay, well in Ruby, if I was gonna store this internally, I'd use a hash. Um, in Python, it would be a dictionary. In PHP, it would be an array. Um, in Java, I believe it's a hash map. In Go, it's a map. In Lisp, it's an associative array. It depends on your language, what you call this super, super simple key value store test style data structure. So if I say in my question that my input is an array or a hash, the candidate may actually have a different understanding of, of that word. This is especially true when you're having someone code in a language that's not the language you designed the problem for. And you should be flexible about language. Most companies at this point are. So keep examples. Give that example data structure as opposed to saying, hey, the input is a hash. Uh, another way to avoid a lot of jargon is to keep the context of your question familiar. So this is a place where jargon can come in via technical terms or company specific um, wording, phrases, things like that. So here's a potential interview question. Given a DNA sequence, write a function that determines the most common nucleobase. If you don't know uh, biology or it's been a long time, this is gonna be hard. Do you even know what a nucleobase is? 
I can make this more approachable and help with the jargon by giving any examples. So given this sequence, return A, because A is the most common letter in that thing. But a lot of people I found will still freeze if they don't know bio, because they're going to assume there's something about the context that's super important to this question. Otherwise, why the heck did I include the context? Here's a version of the problem that's more familiar. Um, so given a list of votes, determine who won the election. It's a pretty familiar and fairly universal context. And this is useful if you want to be able to see if a candidate can pull the underlying com computational problem out from a context. But here's actually the same problem stripped of all context and even more approachable. Write a function that determines the most common character in a string. So if I was gonna give this question to someone who was a new grad or someone who was, you know, had a couple years of experience, I would probably use this example. If I was gonna give it to someone who had a similar cultural background to me, I'd probably use the voting example. I would never actually give the biology example because it doesn't actually give me data if someone doesn't know bio. It's not useful for me. What I want to know is that they can code. And if they can figure out how to approach a computational problem and extract the computational problem in a solution from something that looks like a spec. Uh, so here's some problematic contexts that I've seen. Uh, sports and games are often problematic. People are like, well, people already know sports, so they can look up the rules for games on Wikipedia. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you give them all the info they need. Simply the context is enough to throw a lot of people off, much like it was with my biology thing with an example. They have all the information they need. I still know that that's going to throw a bunch of people off. So just don't use sports and games. Uh, or if you do, make sure you have an alternate problem that doesn't use them. Um, industry. Anything specific to your industry, unless industri industry knowledge is absolutely a requirement, requirement, then tread carefully. And things here are like finance, retail, stuff about credit card processing. Any sort of industry specific stuff is likely going to be problematic. And math, yeah, really. Um, we actually think of math as universal, but one of the things I learned when I was working at educational technology is that different countries and even different school systems within a country actually teach different ways. So what you might think of as long division or the long multiplication algorithm is likely completely different elsewhere. And so this is a place where context sneaks in and jargon sneaks in and we don't realize it and you'll get halfway through a problem and realize that someone else is using a completely different long division algorithm than the one you learned. So just don't. Um, job questions should be relevant. Uh, so make sure that you're focusing on stuff that's relevant to the job. Example, don't ask about memory management for a front-end web job. Don't ask about don't ask back-end folks about JavaScript and CSS. And mostly don't ask folks to implement common data structures and algorithms unless you want to work with someone who rolls their own crypto and their own hash table. You don't. So don't ask about that stuff. Uh, and damn it, no riddles or tricks. I don't need to know why manhole covers are round. And yes, I was asked that question when I was interviewing for a job at Microsoft. And no, we do not need to know how many ping pong balls fit in the 747. As far as I know, Google is not asking questions like this and hasn't at any point in the last six years while I've been there. There are other ways to get information about how people solve problems in interviews. And you know, we ask those by asking questions that are relevant to things they are strong at and relevant to the job at hand. Um, another tip, and this one I haven't really seen from others, a lot of the stuff you hear other places, but this one's I've found is really helpful for making folks feel more confident. Ask your question out loud and in writing. For any question that I give, I read it out loud, but I also give it to the candidate in writing. In person, when we were in person, I would print it out and hand it to them and let them scribble all over it. Um, now that we're in the virtual world, I will copy and paste it into the file that they're editing in and you know, comment it out so they have the question readily available to them. I personally do better with the spoken version, but a lot of folks do better with the written version. This is especially true if English is potentially not their first language, or if you have an accent or you use a lot of slang. Giving them both gives them both options and lets people pick which modality is best for them. Um, this one's also a bit more subtle, but in your questions, please don't overspecify. Here's an example of a question that's too specific. Calculate the winner of election. Handle ties by selecting the first candidate. Handle invalid inputs by prompting the user for clarification. It actually may seem super helpful as an interviewer to provide information about all the edge cases, but my experience says is that this is too much info up front and it will shut people down. Some folks will not, will not actually ever get to the edge cases, so providing them up front is distraction for those folks, and we want them to feel successful even if they weren't successful. We want them to have a good experience with the company. And often, if you are overly specific, it's an indication that you have a specific implementation in mind, and by having a specific solution in mind, you may be preventing the candidate from using other equally valid solutions. 
I'm a freak who really likes recursion. And in an interview question I was asked, the interviewer really, really wanted me to use an iterative solution. And my brain was fried. It was the last interview of the day. I could not get to an iterative solution, but I had a recursive solution in mind. And they kept pushing me toward an iterative solution. And I eventually had to tell the interviewer, stop. Let me get something that works and then we can figure out which way is better. Um, that was super frustrating for me as a candidate because I knew I could solve the problem and I knew that, you know, my recursive solution may not necessarily be the best solution in some languages. In other languages, Taylor recursion is not a bad plan. Overspecification is often a way that you can, you know, push a candidate to a specific solution, even if there are multiple valid ones. So don't overspecify. You can keep, you can keep things like how to handle ties in your back pocket and when the candidate asks about them, you can give them that information which brings us to encouraging questions. Uh, encourage the candidate to ask questions. In all of my interviews now, I say, hey, I'm sure I didn't give you all the information you need here. I gave you a good start. If something's unclear or you don't understand something or you run into something weird or an edge case or something, ask me and we'll talk about it. I really like this approach. It doesn't overwhelm the candidate up front. It doesn't force them into a specific solution. And also, I get information about whether the candidate can find edge cases. And if I'm looking for someone who can take a spec and implement it, they're going to need the ability to find edge cases. So this is a totally valid way of doing it. If you don't, if you want your interview candidates to never ask questions, that means you want employees who are never going to ask questions, and those are not going to be good developers. Also, mostly, coming back to the start, keep it short and simple. The most common failure mode for questions I see is folks asking something too complex or too hard. Uh, and what do I mean by short? I'd recommend one hour max for a whiteboard question. Um, I usually try to aim for 30 to 45 minutes. And I recommend two to three hours max for a homework coding task. And three hours is really, truly pushing it. Also, if you do a homework assignment, please give folks the option of doing it on site or during the day in a quiet place you provide. I know COVID's making this weird, but some of us some of us can go back to our offices now, which is neato. Um, not everyone's home life will give them a chance to do the question at home. And so if you're gonna require a coding task, especially as we go forward and so places opening up again, let them come in you know, a couple hours early and come in in the morning and do a coding task and then do the rest of the interview in the afternoon. Um, and if you're having trouble estimating how long something will take, this is actually something I've seen a lot working with my team. Here's a rule of thumb that I've personally used. Give the candidate three times as long as it would take you or a friend to complete the problem. The added stress of an interview and frequently for doing something like a whiteboarding task, explaining your work or commenting something thoroughly in a homework problem, testing it thoroughly, that's gonna add a lot of overhead that we frequently don't account for. So if you have your problem, you hand it to your, your bestie and your bestie takes 10 minutes to do it, you have your 30 minute task. So we've done better questions. Now let's do better evaluations. And this is super important because better questions don't help at all if you're not evaluating them well. And a lot of candidates are worried that their interviewer is gonna be a harsh grader. And that's actually much more concerning to them than the question itself or even the modality of the interview. Another thing I've actually heard a lot is that people are worried that their interviews aren't going to evaluate consistently, that they're going to evaluate some folks easier than others and they're not going to hold a consistent bar. So how can we, as interviewers, get better at evaluating? Rubrics. Have a rubric. If you are unfamiliar with the term, a rubric is a rating guide that includes examples of each rating. Most big companies that I've worked at and that I know of do use rubrics at this point because they are super duper helpful for ensuring consistency. But quite honestly, for my most common coding questions, I actually have written up rubrics shared in a doc on our company drive that anyone can access because I need that help to be consistent in my evaluation of everyone. So let's say your job description, here's an example rubric, say your job description includes the phrase knows Python. This might be your rubric. Really strong candidates, you'd expect them to know the standard library, understand the pros and cons of different approaches, and be able to explain them. And you'd also expect them to write Pythonic code. Candidates that don't know Python at all will struggle with even basic syntax. They won't be able to use hints effectively. They may write Python that looks like Java or C. The other two buckets are somewhere between these extremes. For Ruby, it might be things like, can they use blocks? Do they understand things in like, you know, like method missing? Are they able to use appropriate data structures in the standard library and understand things like what an enumerable is, things like that. Um, idiomatic Ruby is definitely super idiomatic. It's not quite to the extreme that Python, that Python is, but you have to keep these things in mind. 
and also be open to different ways, especially in Ruby where we have a culture of there's lots of ways to solve a problem, be open to different ways of being equally idiomatic. Rubrics, by the way, not points. Rubrics are qualitative, they're not quantitative. A lot of folks have a tendency to make an interview points-based, as in they had three syntax errors in their whiteboard code, I take off one point for each of those, which leaves them with three out of five. This isn't basketball, no points. No points. These are qualitative evaluations and rubrics. So if someone gets, um, you know, borderline or adequate or something as their rating, it's not that they got a C, it's that they showed that this, this skill is borderline. I'm also going to hint that you should ask questions of yourself as you write up your interview feedback. This can help you as an interviewer clar clarify your thinking. It can also help counteract a number of cognitive biases like recency bias and anchoring bias. These are two questions that I learned at Google that I really, really like. They work well when paired with a rubric. So if your rubric has three different bucket, buckets like exceptional, solid, and borderline, and you've picked solid, ask yourself, why didn't I rate this candidate exceptional on this skill? Maybe the skill is technical communication. And then ask yourself, why didn't I rate this candidate as borderline? I think of this as checking my work, but it's a really good way to make sure that I'm applying a consistent, uh, consistent bar across all candidates. The other thing I really like about this is that it makes me put into words and defend my defend my rating choice. If you have a if you have an overall rating system of like strong hire, higher, no hire, strong no hire, something like that, you know, which bucket do you put someone in? Again, ask yourself, why didn't you put them in the bucket higher and why didn't you put them in the bucket lower? Another place this comes in is if you work at a company that does job ladders and tech levels. You can ask yourself, why didn't I rate the, why didn't I recommend a higher level or a lower level for this candidate as a way to, to combat your own biases and also have a really rock solid understanding of why you're making a rec hiring recommendation you're making. Uh, here are some more questions you can ask yourself as you give your hiring recommendation. Can the candidate clearly explain their technical decisions? I, I'm someone who values technical communication highly, even in people who are going to be spending most of their hours coding. Um, did the candidate consider common error and race conditions? This is something that I think we often underestimate, especially if we interview folks the way we were interviewed, because a lot of the old school questions didn't actually think about this. Um, and then how do the candidate handle hints and feedback? This is something that I don't think people think about enough, but it's okay to give hints and feedback when you're doing an interview, because you're probably going to be giving feedback on the job. And you want a candidate that can handle that feedback appropriately. Do they take it into account if your hint was wrong? Do they tell you that appropriately? These are all things that I try to ask myself every time I'm thinking about how a candidate did in an interview and I'm writing up my feedback. Uh, and here's one more question I ask myself a lot. Does it matter if the candidate missed a semicolon on their whiteboard code before you ding them for it? Ask yourself, does it actually matter? I don't even know. In real life, an IDE, a compiler, or an interpreter would catch that. So think about it. Does it actually matter? And related to doesn't matter, you should really assume that there's going to be some ramp up time because every candidate gets some ramp up time. If the candidate think it makes a mistake, think about whether it's the type of thing that you'll be able to teach them during ramp up or onboarding. And if so, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe they use a technical term differently than you, than you use it internally. Or maybe they used a data structure that y'all of a company has decided not to use or a particular approach to say sorting that y'all have decided not to use. So they chose not to cache something that you would have decided to cache. Does it matter? I assume you're going to be doing code reviews. I assume you're going to give them at least a couple weeks of ramp up time. My current expectation is between three and six months for people that I hire before they're fully independent. If you can teach it, it doesn't matter. Don't stress about it in an interview. Um, and it, also, this is kind of unrelated to the previous ones, but I found it weird when I first started at Google and I really like it now. I don't actually know if there's any research on this, but I found it helps me a lot to use gender neutral pronouns when I'm writing up feedback. So instead of saying he or she, I'd always use they or the candidate. It's going to feel weird, but if you're not comfortable with gender neutral pronouns, this is a totally safe space for you to practice using them so that when your friends use gender neutral pronouns, you are more comfortable with them. I have actually suggested multiple times to folks I know who are struggling to get practice using gender neutral pronouns to use them in their interviewing write ups because it's a lot lower stakes if you accidentally slip a he or she in. Uh, and by gender neutral, for those who don't speak English as their first language, I mean they and them in English. There's also several others. I always default to they and them because they are the most common ones in my experience. Um, originally when I started doing this, 
I thought it, I was told to do this. I thought it was to prevent bias from others reading my feedback. So, you know, if they didn't know if the candidate was a man or a woman, then, then when they read my feedback, they would be biased and, you know, things like that. I've actually found, now that I've done it for about six years, it helps me as the interviewer write more objective feedback because there's a lot of words in English that are gender coded and have more net or have more negative um, connotations when applied to a woman versus a man, things like bossy. And so if I use gender neutral pronouns, I tend to avoid those phrases. Uh, if gender neutral pronouns feels too hard, there are Chrome plugins and other plugins for other browsers, things like autocorrect her, that will identify gender neutral, gendered language or negatively gendered language like bossy and will suggest alternatives. I actually have one of these installed in my work browser and it catches things like that. It also catches generalizations when I shouldn't be using generalizations, instead should be citing specific examples of the behavior I saw during the interview. Super handy and super annoying at first. So we've done better questions, we've done better evaluations, so let's come out talk about better attitudes. Better attitudes are the most important. This is where the hazing part in this talk title comes from. People come to interviews with bad attitudes all the time. Generally, one of those bad attitudes is, I went through this, so you have to too. Or the candidate must know more than me about artificial intelligence or Rails memory management, or I don't know, pick your favorite thing. Or the worst one is my job is to, as an interviewer, is to ensure that only the best get through a process. Ew, ew. I don't know how to stress this enough. Please come into the interview with a positive attitude. I don't mean be friendly by that, I mean, positive. And of course you should be friendly, but you need to come in into the interview with a positive attitude, expecting it to go well, not looking for reasons to fail the candidate. I messed this up a lot early when I was interviewing. I'm like, it's my job to make sure that only the best people get through and the candidates aren't lying on their resumes. It doesn't actually help anyone and it puts you in a grumpy mood and makes the experience for the candidate worse. So just go. So the way that I've changed this and the way I talk about it when I talk to other folks is I refer to this positivity as being on team the candidate. So if I'm interviewing you, I'm on your team. Everyone in the interview process should want the candidate to succeed and the candidate should feel that when their interactions with everyone in the interviewing process. If they feel that, they feel that everyone wants them to be successful and that this isn't some horrible confrontational nonsense, they're going to do better. This was a big change that I made in my approach to interviewing, especially in the last five years. And I do more interviews now because they aren't this horrible confrontational thing and I feel better about them. So what does being on Team the Candidate look like? Well, if you want the candidate to succeed, success, if you want the candidate to succeed, you're going to be hopeful. People worry that this is going to lead to hiring bad candidates, but my experience says that being helpful doesn't lead to hiring bad candidates. First, no job actually requires that you work entirely without help. That would be a toxic job. And second, if you are helpful to everyone that you are interviewing, you are you are still evaluating against a common baseline. So what does being helpful look like? Um, offer suggestions. I've actually called them suggestions instead of hint on purpose. If you give suggestions, if the candidate is going down the wrong path or they misunderstood the question, you can help them figure out what's going wrong and move in the right direction. I actually did a coding exercise as part of an interview at a company where they had actually designated an employee as being on Team Me, Team Aja. And they were my phone a friend resource during the coding section. They also took me out to lunch and asked to answer all my questions and helped chill me out before the coding section. Uh, I was so nervous during that interview that I had forgotten to even how to start a C++ class. Like I could not come up with any of the syntax and I am not a C developer, but I was faking it back then. I was able to phone that friend and he was able to get me rolling and walked me through defining the class, defining the first function, reminding me of a couple of the resources they had. And then I was able to actually code away, write my algorithm, figure out my approach, check in my code, and I actually did really well. But if the, they hadn't been willing to offer me that, you know, initial boost, I would have failed. And I really appreciated that they were able to help me out and offer suggestions. Um, and if you're on team the candidate, it makes sense to focus on the candidate's strengths, not their weaknesses. So what does a strengths focused interview look like? It means you don't dwell on mistakes, not even major ones. Um, if someone messes something up or clearly doesn't understand something I was hoping to dig into, I move on, even if it is part of a multi-part question. 
Um, and if I, for some reason, I just can't move on to the next question, I help the candidate get past their mistakes so we can do part B, but really just move on. One of the worst things I've seen in 15, 20 years in tech now is an interview where a candidate missed a question early on about some subtle part of some operating system or some language, I don't even remember now. And the candidate and the interviewer spent the next 60 minutes hammering on it and asking more questions about the area the candidate had clearly already indicated they didn't know anything about. The candidate didn't want to work for that company afterwards. I really hated that interviewer after I saw what they had done. So yeah, it's just, it's just not a nice move. Don't do that. Focus on their strengths. Um, being strength based also means you accept I don't know as an answer. One of the things I tell candidates at the beginning as part of my intro spiel is I'm here to figure out what you are good at. If I touch on something you don't know or struggle with, just let me know. And if we can, we'll move on. If not, I'll help you. If a candidate says I don't know to a critical skill question, like something you really actually want to know, want them to know, you can either, again, move on and just know that you're probably not going to go with a candidate. All right, you can ask what I always do when I follow up is, okay, it's cool. You don't know. How would you figure it out? Would you go ask someone? Would you read a book? Would you look it up online? Everyone's gonna run across stuff that they need to know that they don't know in their jobs. And so making sure that candidates can actually solve that problem for themselves, A plus critical skill for hiring good people. Um, and when I talk about focusing on strengths, sometimes people say, but what if they just don't have any of the skills needed for this position? Okay, first of all, you should have found that in your initial screen. But if you didn't, what else can you do? I believe it's still worth poking around and figuring out what they are good at because even if you're not good at the skills you need, maybe you need someone who's really, really good at Ruby and this person barely knows it, even though they had it on their resume. But maybe they're a wizard friend than JavaScript and CSS. Maybe there's another position at their company that they, they might be a better fit for. So at least try to leave the interview on a good note, figure out what they're actually good at so that you can give the recruiter, you can give the candidate feedback on where they should be looking instead. I really appreciate that my current team actually asks, would they be a better fit elsewhere as part of our write-up? So we can figure out, hey, not a good fit for me, but maybe a good fit elsewhere. Time for the lightning round. So other stuff you should keep in mind, people need to eat, people need to drink, people need to pee, some people need to pump. And, some, and for those who don't know what I mean by pumping, I mean, some people need to pump breast milk or nurse a kiddo, especially now that we're all at home. Maybe you need to give someone a nursing break so they can nurse their newborn. Keep all this in mind when you're setting up your interview. Make sure people have a chance to eat, drink, pee, and do any of the other bodily functions that they require. There are likely legal requirements in your country, state, and or region about what kinds of accommodations you need to offer for disabilities. Talk to a lawyer, but you you should offer accommodations. It is the right thing to do, and frequently it is legally required. If you can, offer coaching. I, I mean, I don't mean like teaching folks how to program, but I mean giving people a chance to understand the interview format. So giving them a dry run interview, ideally with a supportive person who's not going to be on their final interview panel, who can say, hey, I need you to talk more while you're coding, or hey, you really kind of messed up this question. I recommend you go check out these resources to help you out a little more. Uh, be human. Offer a bit of yourself. Not too much. You don't want to tell people about, you know, what you ate for lunch and that rash on your back. But you need to be human. Don't be a robot. But likewise, do not ask personal questions. It seems obvious, but people often ask personal questions to be nice and friendly. And this can backfire for candidates and for you as an interviewer. Even a seemingly innocent question can make someone feel really bad. And like innocent questions maybe something like, have you read any good books lately? If someone hasn't had, it's been so stressed out that they haven't had a chance to read lately, or maybe, you know, their book, most books they've read recently, or things that they don't really want to bring up in an interview, like, you know, werewolf romance novels, you're going to put them on the back foot and put them in an awkward situation, or put them in a situation where they're going to feel like they have to lie during an interview, and that's just not good. So keep your friendly questions focused on things about the job, like, why are you excited about this job? Or, you know, what do you like about your current position? Or, you know, how, I mean, even questions like how long have you been doing something? Not great, because hints at age can make people who are older or younger feel inferior. Summary and cheat sheet. And I will put these slides up on my website at some point in the next couple weeks. So for better questions, keep it simple. Avoid jargon. Use a familiar context. Don't overspecify. Encourage candidates to ask questions. Ask your question both written and verbally and keep it short, damn it. Better evaluations, use a rubric. 
Question yourself, why not higher? Why not lower? Does this actually matter? Assume that you're gonna give candidates ramp up time, also give them ramp up time, but that's onboarding, not hiring. Um, and use gender neutral language when you're writing up evaluations, if you possibly can. Better attitudes. The biggest thing is be on team the candidate, be helpful and focus on their strengths. You are there to make them look good and figure out if the best version of this candidate will be successful at your company, not to make the candidate feel awful about themselves and you feel better. And the lightning round, biology happens, eating, drinking, eliminating, pumping or nursing, offer accommodations, offer coaching, be a human, but do not ask personal questions. Thank you. And please engage on Twitter, engage in all the other places. I am very, very passionate about this topic.